My name is Rebecca Nichols, and I want to welcome you, Virginia Resner, to the Haight-Ashbury Video Oral History Project, and we're really, really pleased that you're here. We'd love to know something about you and uh, your life in San Francisco, as well as your involvement in the Haight-Ashbury and beyond. Um, I know your friends call you Jenny. Ginny. Ginny. Okay, sorry. It's Ginny. <laughs> and your friends and family call you Ginny. Um, so, Ginny, where where was your fam where, where were your parents from? Um, my parents, Jody and Herb Resner, uh, were born each of them in Cook County, Illinois, in Chicago. Uh, and their parents before them immigrated uh, from Russia in the late eighteen hundreds. And then uh, you were born. Yeah, I, was born, I was born in San Francisco in 1946. I'm the youngest of uh, three. I, I have two older brothers. We're two years apart. Um, my father and mother came to California. I believe their families came to California in the late 1920s and settled in Southern California. And it was in probably the late, er, they came in yeah, the, the mid-twenties, and it was in the late twenties that I know for certain that my father came uh, to Northern California to Berkeley, where he went to the University of California at Berkeley and graduated from there and then went on to Bolt Law School wow. at Berkeley and graduated from Bolt Law in, um, I believe it was 1936, and it was around that time that he met my mother. And uh, they were married in, I believe, probably around 19, I want to say 1939, it could have been a little early. Well, actually, it could have been a little earlier. And um, my hmm. oldest brother, Hillel, who was known as Tom, and changed his name to Hillel in um, the 1960s in the Haight-Ashbury. Does that have a meaning? Well, it, it, as far as I know, I was a little bit, I remember, confused when he did change his name right. because I thought, well, does that mean you're not the same brother? Mm -hmm. But he just explained to me that it, it was, I think it was somewhat of an epiphany for him to change his name. He had some sure. sort of experience that compelled him to do so. Sure. And um, him and many thousand uh, others became sunshine and uh, exactly. raised up. <laughs> I have an older brother whose uh, name is Bill, who is no longer alive. Um, but the three of us were always very close um, ever since we were young. And uh, my, our mother died um, when we were quite young, all of us, in the early mid-1950s. And I suspect that that's probably what kept the three of us very close right. together. So we were primarily raised by our father, who uh, practiced law in San Francisco, and who was a... Um, I would characterize him as a, uh, a liberal, uh, classic liberal Jewish lawyer of his time. He was a member of a firebrand, radical liberal group of lawyers during that period of time in San Francisco that were uh, representing mostly people that were considered underdogs. My father was very active in the Longshoremen, fight for Longshoremen in the late 1930s. He was a labor lawyer and he was a maritime lawyer. He um, represented Harry Bridges, who was well known in the labor movement, mm -hmm. who Harry Bridges was a uh, present uh, guest in our home and lived in our home when we were young children in San Francisco, often for long periods of time. So he took his job beyond the office? Yes, yes. And um, so, and he was involved in liberal politics at the time. And so I, my brothers and I were exposed early on to a, a liberal, open-minded way of thinking and uh, politics. And we often were also encouraged to um, pursue it, those things that um, would contribute to the community or the culture that we lived in and to have a good time while you were doing it. Sounds like a wonderful family. Um, uh, you were you were born in San Francisco. Yes. Mm -hmm. And uh, what hospital do you know where you were born? Yeah, I was actually born in a hospital across town in Pacific Heights that is now 
Pacific Presbyterian Hospital, but at the time it was Stanford Hospital. Gotcha. And in fact, the, the building, Lane Hall, that I was born in is still there. It's wow. one of the few buildings that's still standing. Wow. So you lived in San Francisco, you mm -hmm. went to public school? Yes. And high school. Do you mm -hmm. remember the names of your public school and high school? Mm hmm You went to Lowell, I believe. I went to Lowell High School for two years, mm -hmm. and then I transferred. Uh, to a school located on the north side of town called Galileo. I graduated from Galileo. So you then um, were a teenager and you were going to school. And where were you living at this time? At that time, uh, in the around the 60s, I was living in Pacific Heights. In Pacific Heights. Uh -huh. And um, your uh, first uh, memory of coming to or learning about the Haight-Ashbury? Do you have any memories of coming to the Haight-Ashbury and getting involved? Uh, was it because of other friends you had or were you all coming or can you tell me a little about your beginnings with the, with the Haight-Ashbury? I think that I actually, as I recall, really didn't spend much time in the Haight-Ashbury or pay much attention to it until um, my older brothers and some friends of theirs became involved and discovered the building itself, which would, had been a movie theater called the Hate Theater. And my brothers and uh, a couple of their friends found the building and they decided to develop it into, at that point it was vacant. It hadn't been occupied as a movie theater for many years. And interestingly enough, the film was owned by the Sproul family, the Robert Sproul family. And um, I have a photograph um, on my wall at home of my father, who was on the debate team at, at UC Berkeley in the 1930s, um, with Robert Sproul in that photograph. Wow. And so there was many occurrences, synchronistic occurrences, totally. that kept occurring in my life that connected everything. I guess I'm in the right place. But my brothers had both been going to, or one of them had been going to state college, and many of the people that were a few years older than I was came out of state college and into what was going on in the Haight-Ashbury or into the psychedelic music movement at that time. And so they came across the straight theater. They decided that they wanted to do a rock and roll theater, but also not just rock and roll, but what would be an environmental theater, which would also include uh, drama arts, children's theater, and dance, as well as rock and roll, um, live music performances. So they discovered this building, they set about uh, leasing this building, and then went on the, set about on the arduous journey of figuring out how they were going to pay to renovate it and improve it, um, to yes. have it be a community setting. Right, right. Was it called the Straight Theater? No, they named it the Straight Theater, and that's something that I don't really know how they came up upon that no, name. Exactly. Do you remember what it was called before? It was called the Hate. It was the called the Hate. It was called they have the a photo theater. on the wall, and I think that's before it became the Straight Theater. It's called yes. the Hate Theater. Theater closed. Right. So the future of that sign was the Straight Theater. Yes, and the marquee was never changed from Hate to Straight. It, no, it wasn't. I remember that. Um, uh, so your, your brother and, and his friends, they pretty much were the innovators and the creators of this idea to take on this project and make it happen. Your family's very close, I feel, your brothers, and mm -hmm. you are, what's going on here? And, and, and getting excited by what's going on, and that sort of encouraged you and brought you there. Right. Um, do you feel it contributed in any way, uh, sweeping a floor, uh, Making a phone call, helping rest in the restoration, and helping that straight theater open and operate. Do you feel all right? Well, first of all, I guess I'd have to add just a little bit of history of what what would draw me into it to begin with, because sure. uh, my brothers and I were very close. Um, naturally, I would want to. I wanted to be where they were, if, especially if they were doing something that was exciting exactly. and productive and creative. And um, prior to that time, I had been introduced to psychedelics by one of my brothers. And so it, and it was common during that period of time that if you were introduced to psychedelics, that it would be by someone that was close to you or the, that um, was familiar 
with a psychedelic journey or journeying and um, so that was one place where it, where it started also I had one of my brothers introduced me to cannabis when I was maybe 18 or 19 years old and so I was pretty much in that realm I knew that if I was going to explore uh, consciousness that I was in a, a safe parameter if I was with my brothers of course and during that period of time um, the Bill Graham was already operating the Fillmore Auditorium for which many of us were attending uh, performances that were going on there at Fillmore and Geary Street and also uh, Chet Helms was operating the Avalon Ballroom and I believe when the founders of the Straight Theater, including my brothers, came along to do the Straight Theater, their idea was not just to do another music venue, but as I said before, was to create an environmental theater that served the community, which was the Haight-Ashbury. Right. Um, they found the property in 1966 and went about um, trying to restore it and raising the money to do so. And during that period of time, I had gone to live in New York City in the West Village in June of 1966 and did not return to San Francisco until June of 1967, right when the Straight Theater was scheduled to open. During that period of time, they had had a very um, difficult conflict with the City Board Permit of Appeals in San Francisco was resistant in issuing the Straight Theater a dance permit, primarily because there was such an influx of young people into the Haight-Ashbury, and the population had grown so significantly that the city was concerned that if they had another location where young people were flowing into, that it was not going to be manageable. And so, they attempted to get a dance permit for which they were never issued. And the way that the history books tell it is, is that they came up with this brilliant idea whereby they would operate a dance school. The straight theater would be a dance school and not a dance hall, so to speak. And you did not require a dance permit in order to operate. So the straight opening in the summer of 1967 opened as a dance school. Um, with dance instructors being Ann Halpern, that makes a lot of sense. Jerry Garcia, uh, Caitlin yeah. Huggins, right. who uh, had founded the Straight Theater Dance Company. And, and that was great fun. I do somewhat recall that evening in the excitement of the opening and um, it, it was Jerry very. Garcia was the it dance was, teacher. It was very colorful. That's a way to get him in. You're a dance teacher. And, uh, well, what was done is that dance cards were sold. So like kind of a membership card. Right. So you had a dance card to the straight theater. And at the box office, rather than selling tickets, people okay. got student ID cards right. to, to be a dance student. Makes a lot, a lot of sense, because I was Bill Graham's archivist. And uh, he fought very hard for the Fillmore. And he finally got a dance hall keeper's permit Yes. And he had fight the city because nobody under 16 was going to be allowed in. Yeah. So he basically ch helped change the law, allowing young people to come into sh to venues mm -hmm. that are under 16. And you get a stamp and you can't drink alcohol and there's mm -hmm. a way to control it. But, and I'm so impressed knowing this is such a, I've never heard this information it's, yeah, on, on how they pulled it off and how they made it work. And, uh, makes a lot of sense because I've been calling people and talking with them about the straight and yeah. I've been hearing a lot about dance and now it makes a whole lot of sense. Yeah. Unfortunately, me. many of the publications and the stories that have been told about the straight theater over the last 20 years are not accurate. No. And there's That's been many published here. accounts. That's why you're here. And <laughs> um, it's never quite been told the way it really happened or the way that it came down. And in many instances, the stories have been told by people that weren't even there. Exactly. And so that's why it's extremely valuable to speak to those people who were actually operating the straight theater. Exactly. And so you really get the true story of what did occur. So a big part of this oral history yeah. project is get yeah. first hand information. Unfortunately, as, as I saw it um, during that period of time, because it took the founders so long to raise the money and to actually structurally, redo the entire 
envi internal environment of the theater, as well as paint on the exterior, that by the time they got open in the summer of 1967, they only had about six months left to really thrive, because at that point, the community really started to disintegrate. And we moved out of the straight theater at some point, I guess it was, yeah, in 1968, but it was extremely difficult to operate it, uh, as I recall, in the latter part of 1968. I remember the street closing. 1968. I remember the street closing with the flatbed truck and the band yes. playing. And the streets were mobbed. The street was mobbed with people. And then the yes. police would arrive at 6 o'clock or 5 o'clock and you needed to go. Yes. And just like magic, the front doors of the street theater mm -hmm. would just swing open. Mm -hmm. And whether it was psychedelics or mm -hmm. kind of whatever it was, or people just alive on the music, there was a place that was positive to move them into. Yes. And every single time that happened, the doors of the strait were open. Mm -hmm. If they weren't there, I don't know where these young people would have been and mm -hmm. dealing with the police and whatever. Mm -hmm. It was a natural progression of getting off the street because mm -hmm. the truck was on Schrader mm -hmm. and Haight, mm -hmm. and there you had the next block, Cole. Mm -hmm. It was right there and it was mm -hmm. perfect and when the police would come and horses and sticks mm -hmm. and the whole thing the positive vibe just continued the, those doors swing wide, wide open with smiles and open hands the staff waiting to mm -hmm. help organize the crowd and help protect them in a way now are you talking about in? the flatbed truck at the time that the grateful dead mm -hmm. was playing and they they plugged into the straight theater yeah. right now i don't recall exactly when that occurred if that occurred in 1966, prior to the opening of the theater, or if it happened... It was, the theater was opened at the time. Either if it was after that, if it occurred in mm -hmm. 1967. Quite frankly, I, I don't recall... I don't believe that I was here in Present San Francisco that. when that event occurred. But shortly the after the theater opened, we had many events there, both um, rock and roll um, music and groups playing, and also had uh, many uh, plays that occurred there as well as um, Children's Dance Theater, and Halton came and presented dance programs. Uh, Kenneth Anger came to the theater and produced a play there. Whether it ever got completed or not, I'm not sure. There's a very interesting story that someone else will share with you about Kenneth Anger putting a hex on the straight theater, <laughs> which is, is quite interesting uh, history. And, but while the time that I was there, because I was the younger sister of sure. the founders, and there was some another younger sister who was also Connie Williams, who was the younger sister of Reggie Williams, um, we girls often got relegated to doing some of the really slimy, grimy kind of cleanup totally. jobs. And but that's so what kept the place at, together. At the end of the day, when everything was said and done, at one o'clock in the morning, we were the people that were cleaning up the lobby and, and cleaning up the bathrooms and, and all of the debris and at the end of the day. And I remember helping um, dress the windows in the front of the theater with posters and things of that nature to advertise programs. Um, all of us kind of contributed to making sure that the handbills and the flyers and the posters would get distributed. And I don't recall really spending a whole lot of time on the street itself as much as I was, there was enough to do in the theater sure. between programs and being sent out to run errands over to the hardware store sure. to get something sure. back and forth and getting ready for the next event Sure. that I, I can remember tripping up and down Hate Street. Right. <laughs> but I don't remember just hanging out, right. ever really spending a lot of time just hanging out on the corner. Well, it's your hard work kept it open, and that's yeah. what it is. I notice you have a, a letter in your hand. I do. I brought um, a piece of writing that my oldest brother, Hillel, wrote to me while I was living in New York City in 1966, and we were corresponding. I was writing home and letting everybody know how I was doing on my East Coast adventure, living in the West Village, and uh, Hillel was writing me back and giving me periodic updates about how they were progressing with the development of the theater. And this is really extraordinary. Here oh, is a actual letterhead that has the straight theater's letterhead 
a letter that has a straight theater's letterhead on it. That's amazing. It looks looks like it was printed today. It's yes. in such good condition. And so they were very um, artistic and creative, and they, in fact, were very businesslike, believe it or not, among it. all the madness and nuttiness that was going on. They um, were doing sensible things like printing letterhead. That's right. <laughs> Becoming established. <laughs> Becoming anything anything established. in that letter not personal that... Maybe he's telling you what's going on. Yeah, in, in fact, there's a, a good you might portion read, of read it that I'd like to share with you, love to hear which it. is um, quite fun and um, revealing of, of, of what was going on at, at that point. Um, he says, hi, and it's spelled H-I-G-H, <laughs> which would, would be the, the greeting of the time. And it says, uh, sorry for not writing for such a long time. I just have a hard time getting down to it. <laughs> I read the letter you sent to Bills and got a kick out of hearing that you're living on McDougal Street. After Haight Street and Sunset Boulevard, it's probably the craziest street in the country. It used to be far the craziest, but that was before everything went west. Haight Street is getting completely out of hand, and we're sitting right in the middle of it. We're still not open, but it still looks like we will be eventually. People refuse to let the straight theater die. Two days ago, we were sitting here waiting to be evicted when in walked a guy with $1,200 and bailed us out. So our rent and bills are paid once again, sixth month in a row, and we sit in our empty theater with far out walls, still waiting for a dance floor to materialize. Our plans, which had to be revised to include a sprinkler system under the floor, will be sent back to the building department this week, and then all we will need is three to $5,000 to start building. This has been the hang up for the past few months, getting enough bread to do the most essential thing. Now, however, it looks like we'll probably finally be getting it. The same cat who gave us the $1,200 is going to help us promote a huge trips festival, San Francisco Love Festival in LA with the Grateful Dead, Quicksilver, and probably, possibly the Seeds. If we have good publicity and luck, we could net as much as $10,000 which we will then put back into the theater. At the same time, while promoting the show, it appears our new found investor is going to help us going on, get us going on the floor. So pray and wish us good luck. Everybody here is groovy and sends their love. Well, I gotta go and see our rock and roll group. Don't know if you heard that Bill and I are managing a band called the Electric Jungle. They're not so bad. Hopefully we'll earn some money with them before the theater opens. That's beautiful. It's a time capsule. Yeah. And I thought it was really groovy. <laughs> it's really groovy. And so you can see by the tone and the content of his letter that they were truly going hand to mouth in trying to get the theater open. No, it's wonderful. Yeah. And so, um, no, I we, and you know, we did have a, a time capsule which we had intended to put in the ground after the structure was torn down. Um, in when was that structure torn down? In the early nineties, right? And we had a party, and everybody came and brought things to put into the capsule, and but we never got the the capsule actually. Um, what the capsule was was a arc lamp that came out of the Mitchell Brothers Theater on right. Farrell Street here in San Francisco. A big lamp, a uh, arc lamp, and it opened up, and it it had a, it was made out of I don't know what it was made of, steel maybe, and it opened up, and you were able to put in things it? in it. And so we collected a lot of things to put it? in it. 
Well, we paint. We had a party. We painted it, and we collected all of the paraphernalia to put inside it. And then we never did um, do anything with it. We didn't get it into the ground. So where is it? Well, it sat in my garden as an (laughs) art object for many years. And then there was an auction at Butterfields about seven or eight years ago at Butterfields Auction House here in San Francisco where money was being raised for the Haight-Ashbury Medical Clinic and for other community programs. Right. So we collectively decided to take the time capsule and put it into the auction with some of its contents, and it was purchased by a man who lives in Northern Marin. Very Very interesting. Uh, From what I understand, there are time capsules that people have dug and yeah. built all over the place and we just they just recently had a ceremony where they had towards the end of the 60s buried the the symbol of the hippie mm-hmm. in Boy Vest is the park and everybody has been looking for a few years where was it we've just turned up through the research it was Boy Vest park and uh, this last Sunday they had a big ceremony there where they took a, a tablespoon of dirt and had a big parade to city hall sprinkled it on City Hall steps and uh, supposed to be the, to bring back the life of the hippie in the mm-hmm. Ashbury, yeah. you know. So it's, it's a little bit of everything. Um, uh, I would love to just bring you to the present a little okay. bit. And you're a wonderful spirit, great energy, <laughs> and you've shared so much. I noticed that you were given an award for the Drug Policy Alliance, mm-hmm. and a lot of your working has been in human rights yes. and the drug war. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Can you give me a two-minute, three-minute about yeah. this? I would love to know um, a little about this. I've uh, been involved in drug policy reform uh, for the last over 10 years, since the early 1990s, and I originally became involved in what federal sentencing reform with mandatory minimum sentencing reform after a close friend of mine had been sentenced to a uh, five-year sentence for uh, for uh, drug distribution and was sent to federal prison. And then as a result of that, I got involved in the reform of the sentencing laws and um, through that became involved with many prisoners of the drug war that were serving very long sentences, sometimes up to 20 years. More than somebody committing murder. Yes, it's just not because in, in the proportion. federal laws, the, the drug laws are based on the type of drug and the weight of the drug. And so during the 1990s, for instance, there was a lot of deadheads that were rounded up at Grateful, Bread, Grateful, Grateful Dead concerts, and they were busted because they had LSD with them that was on a piece of paper, and the feds would weigh the paper and that translated into a 10-year mandatory minimum sentence. And so saw so thousands of people in the 1990s going to federal prisons for long periods of time. And among that were women, were a very high count in that because they were in relationships with boyfriends or husbands or friends that were trafficking in drugs. And the way the laws work, that basically um, kind of the federal government managed to Codify those drugs. Yeah, it's like thought crime. You know, if you knew about it, then you'd become subject to conspiracy statutes. And so I saw this tremendous travesty being created, and I became involved in trying to reform the laws. I met other reformers, and we went forward through the 1990s and uh, created an exhibit about these um, inequities and created a book called Shattered Lies Portraits of America's Drug War. And, and from that work, um, I, with others, was honored in 2000 with the Robert Randall Award for Citizen Action, which was an award which basically the message of it is doing work for making democracy work. Exactly. Exactly. And my work continues with that today. I'm active in medical marijuana reform. Do you have a website? Do you have a website? I do. Um, I have a uh, website that I'm involved with. It's called Human Rights in the Drug War. Rights at Human Rights in the Drug War. It's HR95. I uh, sit on the board as the president of the board of Green Aid, the Medical Marijuana Legal Defense and Education Fund, which is another website, which is www.green-aid.com. I uh, am active in the medical marijuana community. It's a healing. And a healing. And so, healing. so you're still active in the community, yes. Uh, trying to make change, yes. trying to have things be fair, and yes. it comes out of a whole long life and spirit. Absolutely. 
We want to thank you so much for You're being welcome. here. We will be inviting you back again. Okay. Gather your papers and your notes. Yeah. Um, you've been very, uh, opened up a lot of doors and brought us back to a period where we're all searching and trying to get first-hand information. Um, and we, we, we just thank you so much for caring and being here and being part of this. So hopefully someone watching this in the future can mm -hmm. be inspired by what people have done and what they can do. So thank you so much. Again. You're welcome. Appreciate thank you it. for inviting me.